Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Much better. <laughs> well, my name is Rick Nugent. For those of you who may not know me, I'm president of the Jamaican Association of Maryland, and I was given the task this evening to do the welcome. Of course, I'm honored and pleased to do just that. On behalf of the organizations, Jamaica National and the County Executive in Montgomery, I'm sorry, Yes, the county executives, Caribbean American Advisory Group, and also the Jamaican Association of Maryland. I say welcome to this very, very special occasion as we celebrate Car Black History Month. And later on in the program, Dr. Win Winston Anderson will have a very special presentation, and I'm sure it will be of historical significance. I just want to say I want to thank you all for coming out on the evening when it seemed to be a nice afternoon when we could be doing something else. Maybe we could catch up on uh, Valentine's Day dinner <laughs> for those who missed it. But you guys took time out to be here. And uh, on behalf of the groups, uh, sponsors, I want to thank you and um, enjoy the rest of the evening. At uh, this time, as we move on with the program, we will have invocation, and that will be the Reverend Canon Dr. Cartwright Davis, Professor of Theology, Howard University, School of Divinity, Rector Emeritus, Holy Comfort, Episcopal Church, Washington, D.C. Good evening. Will you stand for the invocation, please? Up next on Did You Know? The Sandy Spring Slave Museum and African Art Gallery. Sorry. Let us pray. O ever-living and ever-loving God, we give you thanks that you are our God. We give you thanks that by your sovereign and creative love, you have made all of us in your divine image. We give you thanks for the freedoms we enjoy, however limited they might be. We give you thanks for the legacy of our ancestors and forebears who have bequeathed to us a great and goodly heritage. We give you thanks for the blessings of food and shelter and clothing and civic benefits and access to leisure and the sources of refreshment. We give you thanks for the advances we have made in the pursuit of human wholeness and social well-being. Although we have come from a mighty long way, dear God, Help us to be ever mindful and vigilant that we still have a mighty long way to go. In this program of celebration and commemoration for Black History Month, give us all that, we, all that will that we may pursue relentlessly the paths of true justice and social equity and human dignity. Let our minds be stirred Dear God, let our passions be inflamed, and let our strengths remain unabated to do the right thing for ourselves and among ourselves and for the generations yet unborn. This is our prayer this afternoon. For your name's sake. Amen. Uh, next, we will have the uh, recognition of dignitaries, 
and that will be done by Mr. Reese Dean, County Executive of Montgomery County. Good afternoon. I'm Doris Dean. I'm co-chair of the Caribbean American Advisory Group in Montgomery County. And I have the distinct pleasure to introduce to you today uh, some of our very important people in Montgomery County, starting with our erstwhile county executive, Mr. Mark Elrich. Thank you so much for coming and pleasure us with your presence. Council member, Ms. Uh, we had Mr. Will Jawando here a little while ago. But we also have Mrs. Janelle Wilkins, who is a delegate from Maryland General Assembly. <laughs> we also have, uh, I'm so short I can barely see everybody here. <laughs> ambassador Curtis Ward, former ambassador of the United Nations Security Council, hails from Jamaica. We have with us Ms. Andrea Dubida Dixon, Deputy Chief of, Mixon, Chief of Mission, Embassy of Jamaica. You have met Dr. Courtright Davis. We also have a couple of other interesting people with us visiting as guests. Dr. Althea Belcher and her husband, Tony Belcher. And last but not least, our guest speaker and keynote speaker and presenter for the evening, Dr. Winston Anderson. <laughs> oh, we also have Dr. Franklin Knight, I beg your pardon, Dr. Frank, who is a professor at Johns Hopkins University. I think I've covered all who's here. Is uh, Dr. Raymond Crowell here? Because I don't know. Okay, I think we've covered everybody. I wish to thank you all so much for gracing us with your presence, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. Hmm? Oh. I'll invite Ambassador Ward to join us for a moment and have a word. Good evening, everyone. Special welcome to our county executive, Mr. Mark Ehrlich. Elric. <laughs> you know, one thing I must say, um, he never fails to support us and he is supporting our Caribbean American Advisory Group of Montgomery County, which he can, at the stroke of a pen, get rid of us. <laughs> <coughs> so it's very important that when you see this gentleman, you pay him the greatest degree of respect and honor. We want to thank you very much, sir, for what you've been doing in Montgomery County, and we look forward to you being there in that position for quite some time yet. Ladies and gentlemen, it is very important for us to recognize our heritage. And <clears throat> we here, we're in Montgomery County, and the turnout from Montgomery County is excellent, but there are many others here from different parts of this state. But as the county executive already knows, as Caribbean people, we have been making tremendous contributions to the state of Maryland and to Montgomery County, and we will continue to do so. And we appreciate the leadership of the organizations that have put on this event, and we look forward to Dr. Anderson's um, presentation to us, which we know is going to be one that will captivate our attention for quite some time. Again,
Thank you all for being here and I appreciate having the opportunity to say a few words. Thank you very much. And now I will ask you, Mr. Elrich, please grace us with a few words. Um, I'm very happy to be here. I uh, have to say I was, I was in Jamaica once at a very interesting time. And what I took away from my trip to Jamaica is they were struggling with international corporations in the bauxite industry. And I remember that, uh, you know, Jamaica was a major producer of bauxite for Reynolds and the companies. And uh, you had a progressive government that tried to make the bauxite industry pay its fair share. And their threat was that if you don't take our price, we will move the factory to someplace else. And that would have been crippling to the Jamaican economy. And I remember talking to people there because, you know, Jamaica was still struggling. I was there in the early 70s. And Jamaica was less than two decades removed from being in the colony and still struggling with the legacy of colonialism. Um, I studied um, third world development history when I was in college. And one of the things that interested me was the notion that the third world was underdeveloped. And what I learned was the third world was developed deliberately to be what it was, which was basically to provide cheap raw materials to the first world and exploit cheap labor in the third world so that the benefits flowed to the first world and the costs rested in the third world. And that was my educational background, and that's how I bring a lot of what I know about that to my understanding of history and also the implications of the United States. So you're in Montgomery County. Um, we have launched this year an approach where we're going to introduce racial equity lenses to the work we're going to do. Our job is to be accountable and to understand what the impacts of our decisions are on the communities, but particularly the African-American community, because no group has suffered what they suffered in this country, and no group has, has endured the continuous 400 years of suppression and denial of basic rights that in one form or another still prevails in this country, notwithstanding the civil rights movement and everything else into the previous speaker's comment about, or the invocation about, depend, basically there's work to be done. And the truth is there is work to be done. Uh, we're gonna try to make sure that Montgomery County does its share of that work and that we make our employees and our residents more aware of what racial injustice means and what the long-term impacts of that. And we're gonna make sure our programming reflects an understanding of those things. So hopefully Montgomery County will lead the way going forward. We know we cannot fix a national problem by ourselves, but we also know that if nobody stands up and starts to do this work, no one will stand up and start to do this work. So that is something that we've decided to take on. Um, the, the Jamaican and the Caribbean community have a really strong presence in the county. Um, I want to you know, acknowledge the work at the Slave Museum um, because it brings back a history to something Montgomery County would like to, and much of America would like to ignore. And it's important that we have those kind of institutions here in Montgomery County. So thank you so much for the work you've done in making that a part of our history. But you know, you also see, you know, Caribbean folks at NIH and the sciences and in education. You see them in industry and you know, particularly, you know, the business community around here. And so you have participated fully. You send our kids to our schools. You're looking for the same kind of future everybody else is hoping for, for their children. And we want you to feel that you're part of a welcoming and inclusive community. And I can assure you that as long as I'm county executive, we will continue to do that work and make sure that you find a home in Montgomery County that is a place where you feel safe, you feel respected, and you feel like you and your children have a future. You should be able to have the same things that everybody else has that's not asking for too much, it's asking for what's right. And we're gonna do our part to see that we achieve that. So I'm happy to be here today. It'd be interesting to see um, the presentation because I have not seen it before. Um, but I have been out to the Slave Museum a couple of times and it was always informative and depressing in the sense that you realize what people are willing to do to other people and it still never ceases to amaze me. But it is our history 
and we need to own it, and then we need to deal with it. And I want to thank you all for coming here today to be part of this and the part of, you know, setting the record straight and making the record complete. So thank you. Thank you. And I'll ask uh, Janelle Wilkins, delegate to Maryland General Assembly. Please join us. Hello. So I'm I'm short as well. So hopefully you can you can at least see my hair. I hope. Um, good evening, family. How's everyone doing? Good. It's so good to be with you this evening. I'm Janelle Wilkins. I represent this district, Legislative District 20, in the Maryland House of Delegates. I'm I'm very grateful for this presentation and for the time to be with you today. I wanted to share just a couple of things with you. I'm um, in the Maryland House of Delegates. I serve as the House Parliamentarian, responsible for ensuring the order of the business that we're conducting before the state. And we're in session right now. We're in session only for nine. 90 days out of the year and this is the time for you to make your voice heard on what you want us to be prioritizing what we should be advocating for I have several pieces of legislation dealing with immigrant rights and reducing deportations in our state and also supporting immigrant businesses so those are the kind of important topics health care all kinds of issues that we're dealing with and it's important for us to hear from you I was born in Kingston Jamaica I went to Meadowbrook prep until uh, my family moved and migrated to the United States so so I'm certainly passionate about what we're going to talk about today. And as the first black woman elected in this district, I know how important it is to understand our history so that we can make even greater contributions. Thank you. <laughs> Finally, I want to share with you that um, the 2020 census is coming up. It is coming up on March 12th. That is literally a few weeks away, days away. And that it will be our opportunity to make our voices heard, to be counted as a community. For the first time ever on the 2020 census, it will primarily be online. You can go on your computer, get online, and respond in that way. You can also identify your Jamaican heritage on the 2020 census, which we have not been able to do previously. You can check black, and you can, and you can write in Jamaican. So that's something that we want to make sure that we are seen so that when our county executive make, is making decisions, when we are deciding how much funding should go to the, the Caribbean American Advisory Group, we can say, look how many Jamaicans, look how many immigrants are in our community. When we're making decisions, exactly. We're making decisions around health care access. We're making decisions around making sure we have enough Medicaid funding. The 2020 census really matters. So make sure you do two things. You tell your neighbors and family and friends how important it is. It's $18,000. Over $18,000 per person is missed when someone does not fill out their form. So please make sure you, you let your friends and family and neighbors know that. And you can also become a census ambassador by going on the Montgomery County 2020 census website and you can help to get out the count and be trained and find out more information so again thank you for allowing me to be here I'm glad to be among family and I'm looking forward to hearing from you all throughout the legislative session and beyond thank you thank you very much and I'll pass the podium back to mr. Nugent thank you uh, the next person to be here at the podium is none other than the president of the Jamaican National Association of Washington, D.C., Dr. Elaine Knight. She will be, in fact, doing the introduction of our guest speaker. Good evening, everyone. Biomedical scientist and research director. Dr. Winston A. Anderson was born in Kingston, Jamaica. In 1959, Anderson graduated from Colabar High School in Kingston and received his higher school certificate. At the age of 17, he immigrated to the United States and enrolled at Howard University in Washington, D.C. Anderson went on to earn his B.S. degree in zoology and his MS degree in zoology from Howard University in 1962 and 1963, respectively. 
1966, he graduated from Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island, with his PhD degree in biomedical sciences. Dr. Anderson was appointed as chair of the Howard University Department of Zoology in 1975. He served in that position until 1983 and remained on the faculty as a professor of biomedical science. In 2006, with a $1 million grant from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Anderson started the Howard Hughes Medical Research Scholars Program. This program has been supported by the National Science Foundation's Research Careers for Minority Scholars Program and the National Institute of Health Biomedical Research Support Program for minority students at Howard University. While at the University of Chicago, Pritzker School of Medicine, Anderson received the Ann Langer Award for Cancer Research and the Distinguished Teacher Award at the Pritzker School of Medicine. In 1992, Brown University bestowed on Anderson its Outstanding Graduate Alumnus Award, and Howard University's Division of Academic Affairs honored him for establishing the distinguished lecture series, Brilliant Encounters in Science. In 2011, Dr. Anderson received the Presidential Award for Excellence in Science, Mathematics, and Engineering Mentoring. Dr. Anderson is a founding member of the American Society for Cell Biology and was the first African-American scientist elected in 2017 to serve on the American Society for Cell Biology Council. As a member, he created the Minority Affairs Committee to provide support for minority students seeking careers in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and has actively trained generations of African Americans to further pursue meritorious careers. He has devoted most of his years research investigating mechanisms of estrogen signaling in oncogenesis. There's more to this but um, please see his website. Sandy Spring, Maryland, is known for its rich history and landmark, Sandy Spring Slave Museum and African Art Gallery. Dr. Anderson, along with his brother, Dr. Bernard Anderson, co-founded the Sandy Spring Museum and African Art Gallery, Sandy Spring, Maryland, in 1988 and serves as a curator. As co-founder, Dr. Anderson leaves a mark on Montgomery County by preserving one of the oldest freed black communities in the area. Dr. Anderson saw that the history of the black community in Sandy Spring was unrecognized and decided to create a museum that would preserve its history and allow future generations to learn about its past. Dr. Anderson lives in Silver Spring, Maryland with his wife, Carol Anderson. They have three children, Laura, Leah, and Michael. And Leah, we are honored Leah is here with us today. She's right over there, thank you. I present to you Dr. Anderson, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, hello. Uh, um, thank you so very much for inviting me here. I have a story to tell that I think that maybe you may find it interesting. I'm not an expert in history or anything like that, but the one has to exercise the left side of the brain sometime and get involved in things that are, are not directly in your career route, 
but really, uh, really can expand one's own knowledge and, one and, and impart such information to the rest of the community. I want to shout out uh, there is Dean and uh, uh, Ovid Trout and Enid Bogle. These people were there from the start. Enid Bogle especially, she doesn't tell her story. But when the Ethiopian Civil War ended, it was Enid Bogle and a group that migrated to Ethiopia to teach sciences as well as to teach English, English comprehension. And she made a fantastic impact on the education of 9th through 12th grade teachers who did not have classrooms to teach in, but she uh, 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 um, imparted her knowledge to over 600 Ethiopian teachers at a time for three years in a row. Enid Bogle's story is a great story. Now, now, by way of introduction, I'd like to show this very short video. It tells you about the museum and our efforts in, in, in developing it. And my daughter says, just press this button right here. <laughs> okay, pressed it. <laughs> I think you better stay with it. Up next on Did You Know? Up next on Did You Know? The Sandy Spring Slave Museum and African Art Gallery. The Sandy Springs Slave Museum and African Art Gallery was founded in 1988. It's a gathering place in the Sandy Spring community, offering not only its artifacts and art collection, but a variety of programs and events. We visited during the 2018 Emancipation Day event, which marked a pivotal day in Maryland's history. On November 1, 1864, a new state constitution freed all those held in bondage within its boundaries. The decision made Maryland one of the earliest states to abolish slavery, a full year ahead of the 13th Amendment. This museum was built in the Sandy Spring Freedom community that was founded long before emancipation of slaves in the late 1700s. The land that this museum is on today is land that was purchased by the slaves and the family still live here today. The founder is Dr. Winston Anderson. He founded this museum 31 years ago. He is a molecular biologist at Howard University, recently retired, and he is also an Obama Medal of Excellence winner. Dr. Anderson also recently received the 2018 Lifetime Impact Award at the County Executive's Awards for Excellence in the Arts and Humanities. 90% of what you see in this museum, he has collected through his travels over the last 31 years and still continues to collect. He is also an amazing artist and a lot of the relief art and the stained glass are his pieces. This museum tells a story. Um, it's like an adventure. 400 years long adventure. We're talking about a kind of a holocaust in one nation, far, far away. And you have forced captivity of a population. These people are forced to travel on some ship. Forced migration horrible passage, death, just in human conditions, but also think survival of the fittest of the crew. These people were then transmigrated to a foreign land, forced migration again, forced work, forced labor, where they under sea.
Um, I like how personal the museum is. So each piece here is real and was donated by either people in the community or was acquired by the founders of the museum. And it just shows you like a more connected, it makes you feel more connected with history and what actually happened then and the effects of it today. I just enjoyed every aspect of the museum, especially the fact that it's very connected with the community here and tells a very honest opinion about the lives of black Americans, especially here in Maryland in, in a very diverse area. The room that we're in now is all about local history, the history of the Freeman's Village in Sandy Spring. The people here were manumitted long before emancipation and a thriving town was built after they purchased land. There were many, many people who owned their own shops and served the people of the community. I was impressed that Joy and her family were able to trace their relatives going all the way to Canada and they get together. I believe it's every year and I was impressed to see Marcus Garvey's picture back there because I'm originally from Jamaica, West Indies and he is a Jamaican. Welcome to the Building of America room. This room talks about how slaves were brought here to build this country. So I really like old tools and I like looking at those, but it's interesting to hear the, the story of the slaves. But because the work was so grueling and hard and uncomfortable and people were being punished, slaves decided that they needed to escape. And one of the ways to do that in this community was through the Underground Railroad. As the slaves traveled north to freedom, they would hide during the day in secret passages and behind walls. As we move through the museum, here we are in what we call the Civil Rights Room. The reason it's the Civil Rights Room is because all of the things that you see in here, shackles, the Klan, photographs of marketing tools that were used to promote negativity. We have overcome. Despite all that has happened, we have risen. We're now in the sanctuary. This is of special importance to the African American community. As everything that we have gone through as a people, the planning, the confidence to overcome the struggles has come from the beliefs that we have that there is something better to strive for. So this sanctuary represents the heart of the black community. As you look around, what you'll see is many artifacts going far, far back from Ethiopia and around the world. What I like uh, most about it is um, the inclusion of blacks from all over the world, not just America. We rise on the shoulder of our ancestors to achieve. And the way we do that is education. What you're seeing here are desks from the early, early education of African Americans and all students in Montgomery County. But the point of it all was to learn, to grow, to expand our knowledge. And by doing that, this room, the achievement room, shows you where you can go and the heights that you can reach. It talks about the, the, uh, the achievements of individuals, people like County Cullen who came from this territory, others, um, the boys, scholars, Obama and others. It tells a story of the richness of the culture, of diversity, what diversity offers to the United States. We've been here twice and I'm just amazed by everything that's in here and the size of the museum once you get in here. Tons of artifacts that I would have never thought were, were, would be in here. Uh, and then just the way they have it set up, the progression, it, it's pretty amazing. Uh, I tell you, 
for, for younger adults, they really need to come and see something like this right here in Sandy Spring. When this museum was a glint in Dr. Anderson's eye, the community, particularly the Campbells, jumped in and said, what can we do? This community, especially the Campbells and the Thomases, founded this museum, paid for this museum, built this museum with their own money because they wanted the message to get out about community diversity and cultural information. It, it, it uh, engenders or enhances discussion or dialogue so that we can have a better understanding of the people and of various ethnic groups in this country. The museum is open Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday. It offers group tours by appointment. For more information, go to sandyspringslavemuseum.org. Joy did a wonderful job, didn't she? <laughs> Um, for more than uh, 35 years, we have, we have uh, been a voice in the community that celebrated the history, the legacies, the achievements, and the contributions of these former slaves who settled in this very, very historic area. You realize that around 1800, the Quakers had emancipated all their slaves, and they, uh, they were around the county, at the edges of the plantations, seeking odd jobs and not surviving. They were not able to move around the county because Maryland laws prohibited this. They could not cluster because Maryland laws prohibited this too. And they could only cluster and gather if they were sponsored by some special organization. The Methodist Church did come in and they did do a job by founding about 35 churches and their gatherings in little villages around the county. Some ethnic groups got together, parental groups, uh, families. And for example, in Prather Town, you had George Prather, who was a slave on uh, the Blunt Plantation, and his brothers, Resin and John and John's wife, Harriet, they were able to, s to purchase 15 acres of lands in Prather Town. They, uh, they divided the land, built little shacks and log cabins, dog wells and, uh, and septics, and survived for a while, then Prather's Families, extended families, joined them, the Wesleys. And the Wesleys brought other families in, and they built a little store at, at a baseball mound, and they uh, survived for about 60 years as, as, a, as a group. They, uh, they went to children, went to school in Emory Grove, and they did not uh, develop a church or a school system in this area. Well, after about 100 years, Prather Town was abolished. Abolished because of uh, urban renewal and because the, the, the neighbors, the residents, uh, found jobs elsewhere and fled that community. It's now part of Gaithersburg at the moment. But then you had about a thousand, uh, other, about 6,000 other um, freed slaves in the county. This uh, large number, of course, was as a result of Quaker emancipation of their slaves. They found the city of Sandy Spring very, very, very attractive because this, the Quakers gave up slavery and, and were now very interested in helping the, the free slaves. Sandy Spring became a, became a beacon to the, to the freed men. 297 families uh, found their way into the Sandy Spring area. They were not just allowed to stay anywhere. They were relegated to a two-mile area that is now the Freedom Center, or Freedom Settlement in Sandy Spring. 
these people had skills. They were uh, carpenters and plumbers and, and masons and farmers, and they helped build this community to the, uh, to the point where Sandy Spring became the oldest and the freest black community in Montgomery County. This was the center of the Underground Railroad. This was, uh, of course, with very little ability to show the, the stations on the Underground Railroad, but they were mostly done by the Quakers, the Stabler families and a couple others. They, uh, so th this, this history and this heritage and so on um, had to be highlighted. And as I said, we were nothing but a voice to, to, to present this, um, th the information on the, on, the quick, uh, on the residents here. Through presentations and functions, we have focused on the highlighting the history, the legacies and the culture and contributions of the African-American families and their descendants. Through its programs aimed at children and adults alike, we have tried to bridge the information gap and informed all ethnic groups about the advantages of cross-cultural communication and diversity as expressed through the history, the arts, and the humanities. We have hosted Heritage Days, Emancipation Days, Juneteenth, and more recently, the Afro-Latino Caribbean uh, festivals that has broadened our mission to a point to celebrate contributions and the impact of the peoples of the diaspora. So we're not just local anymore, we're also reaching out to the diaspora. And really, our ob main objective then is to uh, demonstrate the contributions of the Jamaican and the Caribbean populations and the Afro Cubano populations to, uh, to Montgomery County. This picture that you see here is, shows how we started. We started as a little, uh, a little farm that had 28 goats and six cattle, llamas, peacocks, and so on. And this was most attractive to the community members. They, we had to get them to know us. So they came, they enjoyed the animals and the petting and so forth, but this work got to be too much. My brother abandoned me because he was head of surgery at DC General Hospital and he felt that that was beneath his dignity to come and help carry corn and clean up the, <laughs> the pens and so forth, you know. So that left me. So we, uh, we decided that we'd give it up, uh, mostly because one day in the winter, I fell, I had a sack of corn on my back, and then when I woke up, there was a cattle all over me. <laughs> and I, I said, that was too close. It was a bother. The llama that we had was just fond of getting out and playing tennis on the Ross Body Community Center, and uh, we had to hunt it down, and that was not a job for, for a weak old fellow like myself. So we gave it up. We petitioned the community. I said, what would you like here? And of course, the young people said they wanted a swimming pool. But I would be mad to put a swimming pool in this area well, because of the liabilities and so forth. So we decided that we were going to do this museum. And so it took 10 years to accomplish this, this job. And as you see here, that's just the plant uh, in its e evolution. Here you see that the, uh, the outer buildings were made and the uh, the main building, as you see here, is just a concrete block. It stayed this way for about five years because we had no money and we had it covered with a tarp. Anyway, we got it done and we were able to, to, do the, to, to build it over a 10-year period. And she says, Professor Arrow. And this is what the campus looked like after a while. And I really give credence to my mother who would be every day, every week. She wanted to get out of the house, and so she was up here with me as long as this building was being made. She lived until 99 years. So it's just here. And you see, I wanted to point out to the community what the clippership was, because those New England people who founded Harvard and Yale and uh, universities in the North claimed that they were not involved in the slave trade, but they were. They built the ships. That, that, that was involved in the slave trade. And here we have a clipper ship. I really wanted to point out one other fact, that this clipper ship 
um, w was very active in the East African slave trade. We seem to forget it. But they would go down to the coast of the Cape of Good Hope and up north with the trade winds all the way to Zanzibar, collecting slaves and distributing slaves. And then on the way back, they would bring those slaves using the trade winds again and swing all the way south to Brazil until 1889. So that was the importance of the slipper ship here. And the cabin. Cabin came from uh, Mr. Hollowell's plantation. Mr. Hollowell was not a slave owner. He um, was a serious abolitionist. He was the fellow that uh, um, organized schools in, in uh, Virginia. That his, famous, his most famous student was General Lee, Robert Lee. But he was a, a first president of the University of Maryland Agricultural College, wouldn't take the job until, he, uh, until the slaves were released. He's an absolutely amazing man, and I think he, brought, he founded Bryn Mawr. This was an interesting job here. It's an endebele hut. And we found out that this, discovered that this was the same size and shape of the hut that Nelson Mandela was born in and grew up in until he was 11 years old. We felt that this was important. It houses all the artifact explaining the culture of blacks in the world, in the diaspora. And this, of course, is the building that was founded. The museum is very active. We have uh, at least 2,000, 2,500 students from the Montgomery County public school system and from home-grown, home, home educated schools and, and uh, elderly church folk and so on coming to the museum. So it's very active. Our problem is that we don't have enough docents and manpower to, to really run it and make it uh, more efficient. Hour is not working there. I got it. Now, we continue with our preservation studies because that has been paramount in our in all our activities. We looked in the um, the the ledgers and in the handbook that shows the old homes of Maryland businesses. Here you see the Odd Fellows Lodge. This lodge served the the Sandy Spring area as the only social place that these blacks could uh, put, uh, could could reach. This lodge, Oddfellows Lodge, survived for over 150 years, and mo people from Howard County and Maryland and Rockville and all those places, this is where they had their social events. When the Sandy Spring Church burnt, the, the lodge became a school and the lodge became a church. And so those two edifices right there, the Sandy Spring Church and the, Sandy S and the Oddfellows Lodge was uh, paramount to the social standing and religious uh, activities in this part of Montgomery County for the blacks. Well, this is how we found it 10 years ago. It was covered, it, th there was no roof on it. The neighborhoods wanted to destroy it. We said no. We formed a preservation committee, mostly through the activities of my daughter, uh, Laura. Laura is president of the Preservation Montgomery. And we said, we're going to do something about it. We covered it with a blue tarp, and we said, let's go about getting it done, renovated. We got some funds from the Maryland Historic Trust. Not from the county, but from Maryland <laughs> Historic Trust. <laughs> Maryland Historic Trust. And you see, we, we could stay from the, from the first floor and look up, to, to see the rafters up there. This was a haven for vultures. On their pathway to Florida, <laughs> they would stop here and they would be absolutely the scariest thing you could have ever seen. They, uh, and, uh, and below us, there were raccoons and all sorts of things, you know, big bones. I don't know where they came from, but I don't think they were human. But uh, so we, this is what the inside looked like. We found in the side of this building, there was a beehive. We collected a hundred pounds of, b of honey from these, from these Africanized bees, you know. <laughs> the windows, this is what they looked like. Just, just rotten and decayed. And then we got the funds. And in 10 years, 
we renovated to this is what it looks like. It looks like. And inside, excellent, absolutely wonderful. This is one view from the entrance to, uh, to the podium. And I went back. Okay, it doesn't matter. Okay, of course, I've lost. You never had a slave in the region, no slave here. Not no family, Quakers, Quakers. Freedom they never had a slave, didn't believe in no slaves here. Not no Spanish wing. Quakers, right across the woods, that big Quaker church, they didn't want no slaves around them. No, my this father, my Alfred. grandfather, my great the grandfather, in the area. there were no slaves. He was able to the greatest place in the world where black people is concerned, the right here on Sandy Spring. First black schools opened up, right here on Sandy Spring. This and everything is Sandy Spring. Charm Street Methodist Church yeah. and the school right there. Yeah, the church had burnt down the school then too. And we had uh, some of the schools, my wife taught in one of the little 12 or 12 mm -hmm. school with one teacher, eighth grade, you know. But we had a uh, same thing with tops. We had four teachers. Mm -hmm. It's quite big, huge school with four rooms. We met a carpenter shop. Mm -hmm. I started off in the carpenter shop. <laughs> they do. See, there weren't any high schools out there in 1904 when I was born. Didn't they didn't know my high school there in 1927. The first high school opened up for black people in Rockville. Mm -hmm. That's the truth. Mm -hmm. In 1864, the slaves were freed in Maryland by referendum. These free black men immediately began to acquire land and to establish communities. You know, that was a good place to go to. And it was nice and quiet and a baseball diamond. He was a good man at Bean Johnson. Mm -hmm. He owned it. Now somebody else owned it. They should have named it Johnson's Park. It takes a lot of things away from the black people. Black people own Vernon Santa Springs. And I know all them ball players well. Jackie Robinson, Willie Mays, he's still living. He played, played with Kansas City Monarchs, and the home state grade, and the bottom of Black Sox. And, but we couldn't make no money. That was all. When the World Series was over, the white, the no blacks, they would come to our diamond right down in the North Bay and play us, and we would tear them up. I mean professional white league. I never seen a professional ball game in my life till Jackie Robinson broke the ice. Never. I wasn't concerned. I'm on the board at Citizen Bank. I don't I give it up folks since I'm getting old. Only the black person have been on the board of the bank in the world. Mm -hmm. But let me tell you, I caught hell. Mm -hmm. and a white man and a black man coming in the same field. They would laugh at the black person. They wouldn't give him a loan. They wasn't qualified. This was back to the 60s, 70s, 50s, all 60 years ago. Mm -hmm. But do you not sit there and take in all that stuff? Sometimes you have to kick. Mm -hmm. Kiss till you get able to kick. Yeah. And I put 125 black people in homes uh -huh. and held the mortgage on them. Uh -huh. And that's what made me so happy. To meet the demands of these new black communities, black businesses emerged and with them, black business associations. Uh, we couldn't even go to the bill. And Tom Snowden drove the hurts. Mm -hmm. And he then a black suit, and these two big pretty, and the prettiest of hurts you'll ever seen. And I thought he was the best looking the man that's living, that Tom Snowden. And I said, why well, I wish my sister would hurt my man. It was so good. But sister was good looking too. But I want him to get together. That was a beautiful sight. And then when that young person died, he'd come out with two white horses, pretty beautiful white hearse. And he dressed up, they dressed like girls, didn't they, man? And dressed up in a white suit. Good looking fellow. Urbanization brought both sadness and joy to the African Americans in Montgomery County. Are we able to get the history, the real history? Back then, there were a few activities. You had picnics, the camp meeting, and something like that. 
when one of those picnics were scheduled, and you knew that before it even started, that there wasn't any other picnics because everyone would flock there, like with the camp meeting. And Bob Hill wouldn't build a house for, I'd say, anybody. They had a piece of property and wouldn't even build it. He would build it not necessarily the way he wanted to build. He would have his plans. And some of the things he's going to put in there that he wants regardless of whether he wants or not. And that way he was able to build homes for a lot of people. And of course, I have to find the arrow. Technician. <laughs> Okay, this is a fellow from Toby Town. Let's get his voice. Toby Town, one of those. Um, well, we used to call him Shaq. We used to call him Shaq. And, uh, and, and they wasn't all that good because we, we used to have uh, wood stoves to keep warm by. And uh, we used to have. Uh, then we didn't have a, we had a well, but the well went dry, and we used to have to carry water from Cross River Road back to our home, and uh, we didn't have a, no running water, no lacry, and we didn't have a, we have a outside laboratory, so. It just went all that good, but we just had to live with it. My father used to have uh, a place where he used to plant potatoes and corn and tomatoes and stuff like that. Then he used to, uh, the other stuff, he, he used to have to walk for me out to Travilla. He used to be an old country store there. Now they got a 7-Eleven in there. I used to be an old country store. And uh, he used to have to walk with, uh, we used to call them grinder bags. You know, they, they put the groceries in and throw them up on his shoulder and walk back with them. Well, this walnut tree reminds me of food. <laughs> I used to come by sometimes and grab a few walnuts when they were ripe. She's still alive. She's 104 years old. She's the greatest historian, black historian, and teacher, educator, that we have ever had in this Montgomery County area. She taught for a while in Sandy Spring, but now she lives in Poolsville, written about four books on the churches and the schools of Sandy Spring. Again, we're lucky to get these voices. They, they tell us the history. And this is our mission going for, uh, forward. You know, uh, where the white people owned all that. If they had a piece of land that wasn't good for farming, they would let, uh, give, it, give it or sell it to the black people. It was down near the corn patch or near the woods or in a ravine. What we would call a large portion of land is Mr. Uh, Hill in Sandy Spring. He owned more than 100 acres. Eventually, he kept buying pieces of land, pieces of land. But then they would sell it off to other people. And make a community. Another old community is up in the big woods. That's in the upper part of the county. Uh, Reverend Elijah Hawker, he was uh, responsible for getting that community started. He, he bought uh, land from his, um, the man who owned him. <coughs> and as other slaves were freed in that community, he sold them all pieces of land. And so uh, that developed in, into a big community called Big Woods. Another burgeoning community, Lincoln Park, was established when a Union soldier who purchased the land sold it to blacks in quarter acre lots for $80 each. The right side not to be a people wanted inside the railroad track, but uh, black people wanted a piece of land that was, uh, you know, stabilized in the community. If you have a piece of land, you have your family. 
you know, this area now was probably considered um, poor land or bottom land in the 1850s, 1830s, 1860s. But it's now prized land. This land is, uh, is, is uh, this is the suburbs. It's, uh, the land is going for approximately ninety to hundred thousand dollars an acre in some region. This is the new Potomac. Church was the foundation of the communities and the first site of the schools. The schools started in the churches because uh, Montgomery County didn't uh, provide schools for black children. Uh, well, some of the historic churches, uh, let's see, Sandy Spring would be the first one. Sharp Street United Methodist Church. They had a church and a school before anybody else because they were free first and when the Quakers helped those people to get on with their lives and education was the first thing. They had to have a school and they had to have a church to worship. Somebody in the community would give a piece of land, maybe one acre, to build a church on. It usually started in somebody's little cabin. Like my great-grandfather. Now, so our mission, major mission at this point, is to capture the history and the culture of these people, our ancestors, as, as much as we can. This, I think, will, uh, their words tell us what they did and what the conditions were as they developed this area. Most of them are dead now, for example. There's just one member of living member of the original Odd Fellows uh, band uh, lodge. Now I had to enroll as an Odd Fellow to be associated with the group, and I'm having a hard time get convincing my daughter that she too can be an Odd Fellow or, or a member of the House of Ruth, but she, 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 they, they deny that, and this one here wouldn't even look, listen to me. So that's, that's, that's one mission that we have, and we're going to continue it. The second mission is, to, is what I'm excited about is developing in, in, uh, interaction with the diaspora and to focus on what the county executive said to show the contributions of, uh, of Caribbean folk and, and, and Latino folks back uh, involved in contributions cultural humanities and uh, uh, you know it's too hard to deal with commerce you know there are so many uh, Jamaican restaurants around and stuff you know <laughs> trying to avoid that but um, so we had last year our first annual Caribbean festival and uh, we had the endorsement of the uh, of the county but uh, they didn't follow through but we did it anyway
on uh, the 29th of August, we're ha going to have our second, uh, uh, second annual um, Afro-Latino Caribbean Day. And you have to come because it will, it will feature three very important things. We're going to um, have a plaque and a tribute to Elijah Cummings. We will have a, a, a plaque and a tribute to Josiah Henson. And as members of the park, parks and the advisory committees, they're all interested. Then we're going to have a plaque and a tribute to Marcus Garvey. And we hope that um, his son will be in attendance. But that's just, the, that's just the introduction. We're going to have again, and hopefully with your assistance, we'll, we'll have the uh, session on the contributions of Caribbean folk into to the, to the culture of the, um, of the area. And uh, the co uh, council member, Joango, Joando, is supposed to be helping us on that. And I want to show you my children. <laughs> See, this one on the left is, uh, is head of preservation Montgomery. She's the brains, she's efficient, and she's bright. The one on the left also, right, is also bra <laughs> efficient, <laughs> bright. <laughs> and my technical help here. And this is my son, he is trying. <laughs> So this is all that I can tell you today, you know, come out to the museum and, uh, and uh, let's have some action. Thank you. Well, did you all enjoy Dr. Anderson's presentation? Yes, another big round of applause. At this time, ladies and gentlemen, we'll have uh, questions and answers. So, you're free. Okay. Good, no questions. Good. <laughs> There's no space. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. This, this is a, a love affair that I have had with Africa for many, many years in the Caribbean. And uh, I was involved in a minority health and disparities program that took students to all parts of Africa, the Cameroons and so forth, and Nigeria, and was able to collect art from the diaspora, and Jamaica, and Trinidad, and everywhere. And so this, um, all the artifacts in the museum, the majority of them were ours, but um, uh, you know, we welcome receiving others that we can squeeze it in. But I really want to say one other thing here. I'm glad she got up because she is the, the main impetus that encouraged me to bring Marcus Garvey's uh, presence back on the campus. So thank you so much. Absolutely, you know, that would bring in more manpower and more information. Absolutely, we could talk about doing this. But, uh, okay, and um, the, the, uh, there are only three Jamaicans who live in Sandy Spring. The rest live in Aldi and the suburbs. <laughs> Here, 
the connection of the museum to the career. You know, um, I've read somewhere, you know, that uh, when uh, the direct importation of slaves was uh, prohibited in the United States, they were bringing in slaves from the Caribbean. Were you able to capture some of this in the uh, museum? Not very much, you know. We, we know that the, the flow was there. Maybe you know some more about it. <laughs> yeah, there he is. He's the, he's the author. <laughs> yes. What's the, uh, he has written books about it. You going to say something? <laughs> he's, a, he's a caliber boy, you know. No, no, no. Yeah, another one, and I'm just trying to find out if he was before me or after me. At the same time as you. God. <laughs> you were there together. No, I think it's an interesting uh, observation, because what happened was that before the boom of the cotton in the South, the Americans agreed to abolish the slave trade. They would not have done that if Eli Whitney's cotton gin had actually been applied a little earlier than it did. So what happened was that in 1807, when they decided to do it, to start it with the British, it meant that the enormous expansion of cotton could not uh, depend upon imported labor, as elsewhere in the Americas had happened. And so the big difference in the United States and anywhere else in the Americas is that most of the enslaved labor here was produced domestically. Between 1810 and 1840, the export of cotton went from about 10% of export value for the United States to 50% of export value. Between 1810 and 1850, more than 4 million enslaved people were traded across the South. All of them born in the border states or in the South. So that's a really big difference. Sure, there were a few more imports that were brought to the United States, but the largest, and it, it explains a lot about the psychology of both enslavement and the sort of master class in the United States, because they're actually uh, developing uh, pop an enslaved population from childhood as opposed to, say, Brazil or Jamaica, where they're coming in as young adults and as formed culturally. So uh, that's, that's really an important observation. And the connection is an important one, because one has to go back to remember that most of the southern states were actually settled by English Caribbean people who brought their slaves here in the 18th century. century. So there's a long connection, and I could go on and on, but it's your day. No, no, no. <laughs> go on and on. Which book? <laughs> so, okay, thank you very much. So does that conclude the uh, question and answers, I would assume? So at this time, I would like to call uh, Mrs. Venice Bundle Harvey. She's the co-chair, Montgomery County Executive Caribbean American Advisory Group. She is here to do the presentation. Good evening. I know I'm way sh I'm the shortest person in the house, <laughs> but I'm good. Okay. Yeah. Oh, here you go. Smart, smart. <laughs> Dr. Anza, thank you so much for the for your presentation this evening. I I will promise that I will connect with you, um, and I will talk to the director of the OCP department. Um, Last year, there was transition, as you know, so the timing kind of threw things off. But we will connect with you, and we will work with you after talking to her. Um, your presentation here this evening speaks for itself and all your work over the years. And so this evening, Jamaica National Association, the Jamaica Association, Dr. Rinsford, Jamaica Association of Maryland, and the Caribbean American Advisory Group to the County Executive recognizes and honors 
Dr. Winston A. Anderson for contributions of Jamaican Americans to preserving Maryland's African American history. Presented at Black History Month celebration, February 23, 2020, by, signed by Elaine Knight, um, President of Jamaica National Association, myself, Dennis Mundell Harvey, co-chairs of the Montgomery County Executive Caribbean American Advisor Group, and Rick Nugent, President and CEO of Jamaica Association of Maryland. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, at this time we will have a special presentation and it will be by uh, President Dr. Elaine Knight. So this presentation should have been done in December and um, unfortunately the recipient of this presentation was not able to be at our j and um, Christmas fundraiser event due to unforeseen circumstances, bereavement of the family, so she was away. Um, so Mrs. Moy Stevenson Fairweather, please, please, thank you. <laughs> Jamaican Nationals Association Inc. recognizes and awards Moy Stevenson Fairweather for dedication and long-standing service to JNA 1977 to 2019. And this award should have been done December 7, 2019. And this is coming from Elaine V. Knight. President of JNA. Congratulations and thank you.
you guys. Thanks, everyone. Um, I had no idea that this was coming, none whatsoever. And usually you don't keep secrets from me. <laughs> but um, I guess I was working so hard I didn't even think about it. So I just want to say thank you to JNA. Thanks, Dr. Knight, for being a, a wonderful president. Um, thanks to the members um, of especially uh, my committee, the Cultural and Social um, Committee that uh, worked so hard to um, make this a special day. And I thank you guys for everything. I know Mar Mar is a hard worker, so deserving. Congratulations. Uh, so at this time, we will have the uh, closing remarks by Reverend Dr. Noel Godfrey. Dr. Godfrey. Good evening, everyone. All protocol observed. We'll just run, run through some of these things. Uh, I want to just bring your attention again to what the Reverend Canon Dr. Cartwright Davis said in his prayer that we thank our ancestors who have bequeathed to us a godly heritage. Dr. Davis, you set the tone. Thank you. It was W.E.B. Du Bois who said, the cost of liberty is less than the price of repression. And it was Thurgood Marshall who said, in recognizing the humanity of our fellow beings, our forebears, we pay ourselves the highest tribute. Dr. Anderson, it could not have come at a better time, this presentation. We thank you. We thank your daughter as well <laughs> for all the technology that you lend to us. <laughs> Three organizations came together and partnered together. They are the Jamaican Nationals Association, headed by Dr. Elaine Knight, brilliant president, hardworking president. If you know the amount of work that she did, you'd say, oh, she really worked and showed by example, the power of her example, what leadership is all about. So JNA, the, the Jamaican Association of Maryland, and of course, the uh, county, uh, the, the Caribbean American Association of Advisory Group of Montgomery County. They all three formed this alliance, came together, and this was the production that you have tonight. Give them a hand, please. And of course, I would be remiss if we did not say thanks to the JNA Cultural Heritage and Social Activities Committee, Montgomery County Executive Caribbean American Advisory Group, and the Jamaican Association of Maryland, and the volunteers of the entire JNA organization for their commitment and support. Uh, we also want to thank all the dignitaries that showed tonight. Uh, I know you have a lot of things on your hand. Uh, so again, thanks to Dr. Anderson, his daughter. Uh, thanks to um, Dr. Cartwright Davis. And thanks to uh, our DCM from the embassy, uh, Ms. Dubedad Dixon. Uh, thanks to the highest executive in our presence here, uh, Mr. Mark Elric. Thank you so much for coming, Montgomery County Executive. 
thanks to Rick Nugent, the president of JAM, and for bringing the flags. <laughs> uh, thanks to Ambassador Curtis Ward. Thank you, Ambassador, and Sonia. And thank you to all the ladies and gentlemen who are here today. You made this thing happen. At one time, we were afraid that we would be oversubscribed because at a very early count, it was a hundred and something, and this room is limited to a certain capacity. So we're just grateful for your presence. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. And uh, just to let me quickly remind you of some of the activities of the organizations. For example, JNA College Students Leadership Seminar is scheduled for April, a date to be announced. Uh, JNA Volunteers Serve Lunch Shepherd's Table, Wednesday, April 29, Georgia Avenue, 8106 8 Georgia Avenue. Taste of the Caribbean, Saturday, June 6. And of course, you can read all of this in your program. Um, the Jamaican Association of Maryland bus trip to Hartford County, sorry, Hartford, Connecticut for the West Indian Social Club's 70th anniversary. There is a diaspora group that will be celebrating 70 years. It's not the oldest, but it's one of the oldest. And um, we'll also have the pen relays as well. We're selling tickets for the pen relays, which is scheduled for April. And of course, the Montgomery County Executives Caribbean American Advisory Group. Um, the purpose of, okay. We meet every Tuesday. You meet every Tuesday. Tuesday. That's not, not, not okay. every Tuesday. The first Tuesday of every month at 7, 7 p.m. in the upstairs. I think that's the room across from the Fenton room, the Ellington room. Okay. That's where we meet. All right, Please Venice. Visit us. We'd we'll love to have you. Okay. All right, and the reception uh, will be held upstairs, so don't leave before you taste the good stuff that was provided for you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Of course, we have to have food to end the celebration, right? That's what we do as Caribbeans. So we're going to have the food upstairs just because we didn't have enough space. What I would love to do now is to dismiss this two rows right here, the two front rows to go upstairs, because I need to do this in some sort of order so we're not disturbing the other events going on in the building. So please move as quietly as you can with respect for the other